Um, so we, we have here Arthur Steiner and Leonardo de la Noche, uh, who will be speaking from the perspective of um, art history, one could say, uh, specifically the intersection of contemporary arts, design and technology. Both are very involved in the community organizing and collaborative practice, with, which I think all the speakers tonight and the organizations have in common. Um, both will be engaging in a dialogue and an interactive presentation uh, about the global phenomenon of what they call aesthetic warfare. Um, and the certain practices of image manipulation, circulation, appropriation in relation to geography. Um, yes, so maybe... Sounds good. Yeah? Okay, I'll give you some water and you get to go. Great, thank, thank you. you Arthur. So first of all, thank you for being here, and thanks to Hackers and Designers for inviting us. So we could think a bit more about this research we just started, so we're very open for feedback and comments and, and whatnot. So tonight, uh, we are going to actually start uh, introducing these uh, research threads through two different projects. But first, who we are. So I'm Leonardo de la Noche, I'm a, well, as a training and art historian, and I'm editor of Volume Magazine. And together with Arthur, we created the digital or fellowship and uh, research series that is called Vertical Atlas. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Arthur Steiner indeed. Uh, I also studied art history actually together with this man. Um, and, and we were in the same theory class and then became really inspired to set up these projects. And also since a few years I'm working at HIFOS. Um, I don't know if any one of you is familiar with HIFOS Foundation in the Netherlands. Um, it's a Dutch foundation working on digital rights like transparency and accountability, um, um, sexual rights and diversity, and works a lot with like intersectional arts, also design technology. I'm responsible there for the design and arts uh, globally. So I work a lot in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, travel a lot there. And uh, yeah, I'm much more interested actually merged into these projects that we're now going to share with you. Yeah. And, we'll, and also, if any one of you have a question in between, like afterwards we'll have kind of more dialogue also with other collaborators of us. Yeah. But like just raise your hands or interfere or, yeah. Interfere. <laughs> Don't throw bugs off. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so let's start. Yeah. So the first project we want to uh, mention for the framework of aesthetic warfare is Digital Earth. It's a fellowship uh, we created for artists and designers from Asia and Africa who are working on the materiality, any materiality of the um, digital reality. This is a six month program, it's a sort of distributed residency. We have this amazing group of 17 people who are working on uh, themes that range from infrastructure, technology, geography, and cosmology, and anything in between uh, all these various elements. Probably you've heard the name Digital Earth already. Um, it was used the first time by Al Gore in 1998 at the California Institute for Sciences in, uh, in LA, where he laid out a technological vision for a new future. And to speak about it, he uh, presented an interface. This interface was called Digital Earth, a virtual spinning globe, a representation and a tool to work with all the data captured by a fleet of satellites, by corporations and the military airplanes, sensors across and around the globe. So this daring amount of information uh, would be distributed among different computers around the world, and then compare the cross-references cross -reference through software to create this operational image of the globe. So this project was meant mostly for the scientific uh, community and it was framed, was framed by Al Gore as the early internet. So that was the, the huge ambition of the moment. Um, in a way, there was also kind of political imagination behind it was the kind of American globalist one, to create a new citizen that will, will be able to browse the world, to know how the planet works, etc. But the sort of original idea for this uh, was is by, by Mr. Fuller, the Geoscope from 1962. Yes, by Mr. Fuller. There, that's not the Geoscope was meant to be much bigger. So it's a 61 meter globe made of glass and light bulbs controlled by several electronic computers. So there, historical and contemporary data will be projected. So the viewer could enter this uh, this glass dome and experience. Uh, like the, the unity of the world and the complexity. Like there was the space race uh, at the moment going on between the Soviet Union and the US. So there were not that many images of Earth as a planet. So again, there was sort of political and cultural imagination um, embedded into this project. 
If we fast forward to the 2010s, um, the World Economic Forum started publishing a series of articles about the sharing economy space. So they claim there is a vision um, to basically implement a satellite infrastructure that will um, allow for cheap services powered by, by satellites that users and smaller corporations could use not only the big guys like the Elon Musk of the world, and you could take a picture of your house maybe in like five to ten years for directly from a satellite, but this widespread uh, satellite infrastructure, so sorial apparatus, will create such an amount of data that will basically constitute a digital twin of the planet. This is a very, well, it's a kind of grandiose image of what it is. Hello, hi guys. So it's a grandiose image of, um, of the problem, of course, there's, you cannot compare kilograms with bits, but this tells of this kind of imagination to make a twin of Earth through images and data. It's a recurrent theme in these sort of techno-deterministic visions. And more recently, this took even a step further, and on 1st of November this year, so 20 days ago, in London, the Earth Biogenome Project was launched, uh, which is a joint venture between different global actors, two big genetic Chinese corporations. And the aim of this project is to uh, map the genome of all uh, complex life forms and then digital, digitally store it. So sequence it and then store it. Uh, it's a five billion a small project and it's going to expect it to produce trillions in megabytes to map all, these, uh, all the complex forms of life. So time will tell us what kind of representation comes out of this, of this type of project. The second one, the second project we've been working on is called uh, Vertical Atlas. We have recently started it with Benjamin Bratton. And uh, the project is aimed to create a new, at uh, creating a new technopolitical cartography of the world by uh, analyzing, investigating, and speculating on five different geosomes, which are namely Europe, uh, China, Africa, the Persian Gulf, and the Middle East, and Russia. Uh, if you are in Amsterdam, on the 2nd of December, we have uh, the event at the State League Museum on Russia, technocultural tradition, Russian stock, and whatnot. So you are, you are all invited uh, from, to come. From a leafage to Telegram. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the marketing <laughs> title we get. It, so um, so uh, what is the urgency of this project uh, for us? Basically, we uh, are applying the conceptual model of the stock. I guess you are uh, probably familiar uh, with it if you are designers yourself. Um, to actual geographies, to these different regions, to kind of uncover the frictions between different layers and different sovereignties. So the urgency is that um, current maps fail to represent the complexity of the technopolitical reality we live in. So creating new maps is, in a way, creating new interfaces. And it opens the possibility for different political and cultural imaginations. So the project is based on the geographical scope of the digital Earth, so Asia and, uh, and Africa, and let's say, perhaps in non-Western um, locations and latitudes, and on this new concept that Benjamin produced that is called the multipolar hemispherical stacks. I'm gonna try to give you a one-liner to explain it. Of course, it's very complex because it's Benjamin. But uh, multipolar hemispherical stacks are sort of um, grounded stacks, sometimes coinciding with a Westphalian state, like in the case of China. China has the Great Firewall, and it's kind of vertical uh, stack in itself and coincides with the state. But sometimes uh, that doesn't happen. That's the case of the GAFA stack or the American one. You can change the slide in the meantime, uh, which is Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. So the kind of cloud platforms creating a new type of sovereignty. So the differentiation between these different stacks, there is a Russian one. We're going to try and see if there is an African stack and, um, and a Gulf one, in a way, a Middle Eastern one. So this kind of enclosure, China is the best example. You create the great firewall, so your your, your shelter from, from the outside in a way, your so like your sovereignty is clear, clear also in the cyberspace and within this frame, sort of biotechnological software biodiversity uh, emerges. So if you if you speculate and you think about the artificial intelligence race that is going on between all these powers, also Putin said who's going to control artificial intelligence is going to control the world, so that's probably what, what it means by this. Um, if, if, you put, if you put it together with this artificial intelligence project by the different states, this process will only uh, accelerate, and you will have these different geographic enclosures in, uh, in our technological reality. So to, to kind of like wrap it up, our thesis is that 
um, there is an emerging technological biodiversity that might create a technostatic biodiversity in different areas of the world. And now Arthur is going to dive into some examples yeah. of the aesthetic warfare. Yeah. Um, yeah, now we're actually entering a like, more speculative uh, part of the research because we just started with this. Uh, as was mentioned actually um, uh, earlier, we started this with a presentation in Mexico, earlier with Nishan Shah. Um, um, maybe some of you know him. And um, um, we developed this concept of uh, aesthetic warfare. And um, um, yeah, we're now gonna go into like new unexplored territory for us. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we really would like to have your input also on this and, and like your thoughts. Um, yeah, that's actually a, a data server collapsing from a truck. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, exactly what uh, Leonardo was mentioning, um, um, we really want to focus on this emergence of a kind of biodiversity of techno-aesthetics. Um, and, and we really would like to research that from a global perspective. So we have gathered a group of researchers coming from uh, China, from um, uh, Senegal, from um, uh, Uganda, Iran, um, so from different kind of geographical zones to explore this kind of um, yeah, local manifestations of um, uh, techno aesthetics, you could say, or like of um, um, yeah, images and how they work. And that's also maybe relating to the theme that you were describing huh, about fake news. And um, um, what, what we notice, um, I noticed over the short period that we were doing this uh, over the last weeks, is that this concept of fake news and like um, deep fake videos and like this entire debate is kind of framed or like positions from a Western perspective. And um, like there are all kinds of uh, assumptions and like also notions behind it that are kind of like European and especially North American centers. Um, and of course, like relating to this uh, battle between you could say the alt-right and the left. Well, that's not maybe necessarily the case in many other geographic regions. And also, um, yeah, this, this is, yeah, this is something we want to dive into in these specific regions, but also looking into how these kind of aesthetics are clashing between each other and between these kind of uh, stacks, these multipolar hemispherical stacks. Um, yeah, and maybe also to mention, uh, we are of course art historians, so we are very interested in this kind of visual representations. Um, maybe... Um, to give like a first example, well maybe maybe maybe, maybe just as a first as a, as a kind of reference, like uh, we had this conversation with an Egyptian friend about this, and already she uh, immediately said um, about uh, this debate on fake news and like the undermining of the media. She said like, okay, but um, actually uh, no one trusts uh, the media anyway in Egypt. Also over the last twenty years, no one trusted the media. So um, uh, this, this, this kind of effect might, might play out differently in that specific context. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, to start with um, Africa, like over the last year uh, we traveled to uh, quite some countries like Uganda mostly, but also um, um, to Tanzania, to other areas in Africa to meet with research institutions like 32 Degrees East or um, uh, PVI in Uganda. And uh, they showed us some interesting examples, actually, of aesthetics and fake news and, like, use of imagery. Um, and maybe to start um, uh, with, with one example is the massive amount of content that is, of course, coming from Africa. Uh, what really struck me is these um, video productions, online contents created by, for example, Wakaliwood. Maybe some of you are you know, familiar with this. Um, uh, someone is nodding. Yeah. Someone is nodding? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is actually an emerging uh, movie industry coming from the slums um, um, in, in Uganda where people are really using like, um, 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 yeah, smartphones to create like movies. Uh, I met a guy who, who created a karate movie um, um, uh, and that movie only got 16 million views just to, just to, uh, to, 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 yeah, to indicate the kind of widespread uh, of these contents and like how many people are actually watching this. Um, um, and to give you an example of this, I have here a Wakali Mood production. And you see also how it's remixing specific elements and cultures. <laughs> So, 
So these Tarantino kind of movies. Um, uh, <laughs> they're actually really uh, well watched and um, uh, on different kinds of mediums. And then there is, there is this other um, um, element that might be different from uh, how we uh, consume this kind of content. Um, in uh, specifically in Uganda, this is done um, on the background. You see this kind of uh, local video halls. Um, there are five official cinemas in Uganda. I noticed when I was there, they told me there are five cinemas, but there are 4,000 local cinema halls. So these are like these kinds of places where there is like a, a television screen or a computer. Uh, and these kinds of movies are played there or other kinds of movies. And um, w once there is a Western movie that's actually live, uh, lively dubbed by someone. So there's someone actually narrating what's happening in the movie live and also remixing it with other things. So it's like... The conversations are different from the script. So they're mostly made up and remixed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's like this indeed like new kinds of aesthetics emerging there. Um, and of course like uh, through social media. I mean like most content is consumed of course on small devices and small, small, small screens and not um, as, as we uh, maybe on a computer. So that's, that's, that's one example from, from, from our friends from uh, Uganda. And then um, I used to live myself actually in Egypt um, uh, and uh, was there during the, during the Arab Spring on, on, on Tahrir Square. And um, that's also actually quite interesting in terms of aesthetics. Of course, like there is this um, um, entire story around like how social media and images led to the Arab Revolution. Um, um, but at the same time, there is, of course, like lots of censorship, especially now um, uh, with the current president Sisi. Lots of um, images are being re removed, or uh, people are trying to remove images from the collective minds. And there is um, uh, kind of massive spread also of like billboards and like commercial aesthetics across the city. That's really something I uh, was uh, struck by uh, last time when I when I was in Egypt. Um, I have here a video um, which I really like because it's actually using also these tactics of aesthetic warfare, you could say. Um, uh, over the last, especially I think three, four years ago, there were a lot of videos produced by um, radical Islamic groups. Um, um, like ISIS. Like ISIS, of course. It's like ISIS is the... It's, it's ISIS news. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, um, um, they, uh, these videos were usually accompanied by a nasheed, which is like a traditional hymn. Um, um, and um, actually ISIS produced one of these traditional songs uh, as a kind of battle song. And what happened um, um, by these content creators in, uh, and artists in Egypt is they started reappropriating and like reusing these um, songs in quite funny ways. And also a massive amount of people were watching this. and. Um, a phenomenon, I think, that was not very um, well um, uh, documented in the West, or not very well, um, um, yeah, not, not a lot of attention was um, um, uh, put into this. This is a video, you can hear on the background, you can hear the ISIS song. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> so these, um, uh, these are also examples. Other examples, um, um, a also friend of ours, um, a researcher, uh, Donatella Della Rata, um, uh, did research in Syria on the use of images and uh, media, and she did uh, research. I was once at her presentation on um, the appropriation of a, um, a theme park outside of Damascus um, in, in Syria uh, prior to the revolution there was this um, Ramadan soap opera, um, Bab al Hadda, where um, um, yeah, millions of um, um, Middle Eastern people uh, yeah, watched, watched this series. It was a kind of like yeah, glorifying series about the Syrian um, uh, past. And uh, that's, that's was, that became a kind of like Disneyland or a kind of theme park outside of Damascus and um, with an actual lion even there and like, like all kinds of um, sites. And once the rebels came to um, um, 
uh, that uh, location, they um, took over the theme park and they started to make videos, small videos themselves as being um, um, actors in this actual uh, theme park and in this movie. So they started to um, reappropriating the imagery of that specific site. And um, what happened then again, once they were like driven out by the uh, Syrian army, again the Syrian army took over and started reappropriating the narrative again and like starting to um, um, yeah, counter the narrative again through that. Which led to and they killed their lion as well. They killed the lion as well, which um, um, uh, <laughs> which like lion in Arabic uh, means like Assad. So so this was also like a symbolic reference to the kid of like, like as a protest to Assad. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that that's that's also a fascinating like kind of um, um, aesthetic warfare example we could uh, yeah we are currently researching. Um, yeah, maybe to move on. A uh, few other points, and then we would like to go to the digital panel. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, like uh, of course, like we know and we hear a lot about these kind of liberal expressionists. You could say in uh, like in, in here in in Uganda in the Middle East, but it's uh, worth to say that of course the majority of the content that is pro being produced um, is by conservative groups. Like if you look at the top YouTube channels, let's say in the Middle East, usually like from Saudi Arabia or like um, um, or in uh, um, Af Eastern Africa, it's by the by the churches that are actually uh, bombarding the most uh, digital content online, and um, uh, they are really uh, yeah propagating um, nationalist and traditional uh, values. Uh, here I have um, an yeah I have here a photo of. Um, uh, which which displays this albinism and like the problems around that in some African countries where there is um, yeah this this kind of fear um, around um, albinos or yeah um, in that specific context. And so what happens is that photos are being uh, circulated through WhatsApp, um, um, uh, which like um, yeah like propagate fear or uh, around this. Uh, similar things happened in India. Where um, um, in a specific maybe maybe you know this example actually in a specific village in the south of India, um, um, also through WhatsApp messages and pictures circulating there around witchcraft um, that led actually to the killing of someone, a musician who went to that village in India um, uh, with dreadlocks, um, um, and the local population they thought that this person was one of these witches that was going to kill and like kidnap the children. And they actually uh, killed this uh, this musician, um, and which was also a result, kind of, of the circulation and massive, uh, yeah, like distribution of images around this. Um, so there you see like a kind of more uh, negative side. And also, what's what's of course interesting in that respect is that WhatsApp tried to um, have, um, uh, put measures in place to block this and to to prevent this from happening. But um, um, uh, that's actually. That's actually quite difficult because um, by um, censoring, censoring, or like by kind of um, um, uh, interfering in these kind of local um, um, uh, debates or, or, or fears, they should note also the local context. So let's say in in Kenya, when there are clashes between certain tribes and like also fake news spreads around certain tribes in during the elections, then you have to know, and the algorithm has to know this kind of local context, uh, so it can actually um, 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 yeah, uh, stop it or like uh, work on it. So what you see is a lot of these kind of uh, uh, interference by Western tech companies don't, um, yeah, are not equipped to this local situation. Um, yeah, this, this is just a picture also of the, like, this is a church actually I visited in, uh, in Kenya, the Mavunu Church. Which is massively big, like thousands of people visit visit that at a one ceremony, and um, what you actually see is that people get during the ceremony also social media education and like how to use um, um, a Google Calendar and things like that. So the church also used actually as a kind of technological educational tool. Um, yeah, like, do you have any questions? Because we or examples or comments or comments, examples. but examples we are also, uh, of course, uh, very uh, interested in of uh, aesthetic warfare. But maybe also questions or um, comments. I have 
it's very low, like very practical, but just curious question. Um, who's actually part of this digital earth research? Like you both come with art historian backgrounds. Yeah. So could you maybe say a little bit about the um, what it is? The form of the research yeah. the, the type of researchers that are part of it. As well, yeah. yeah. Because people have other backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, we are, I mean, we are not researchers ourselves in this frame, like, it's more like we've, we set it out, provided the framework, we have a taste for research, but we have, um, there are 17 fellows uh, that we are supporting for six months, and they have any kind of background, like, like, information security, design, art, filmmakers, coders, uh, and whatnot, coming only from Africa and Asia. And then we are partnering with a series of uh, research institutions, so it's like the New Center, uh, Stroke in Moscow, Ashkala one in Beirut, Koch in India, MIT, and uh, the other ones, uh, we have a couple of other ones, Electric South in uh, South Africa, yeah. Kertu Yassan in Senegal, so it's, it's, it's really a network of people and institutions, and then we have about 25, 26 uh, mentors, so they range from like philosopher like uh, Reza Garastani, uh, ben Bratton, uh, curators so like Moses Urbiri from Uganda. Uh, we have uh, film directors. Is yeah, film Senegal Mandela. Film Mandela. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we have we have a lot of people. You can find it on the website if you, yeah. if you like the digitalearth.org. Yeah, really? but it's very interdisciplinary in its yeah. research, and the, the research theme is really to investigate the kind of materiality and the immateriality of the technological reality from different geographical zones. So going from like, let's say, the cobalt mines in Congo and like... Uh, Research by Congolese artists. Yeah, exactly, to like in China, like the Great Chinese Firewall or like... Um, um, the One Belt, One Road Initiative in Georgia, the smart cities that they're building there. Um, so it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's very diverse in that yeah, sense. Exactly. So. Or do some of you have the specific, when, when you think about aesthetic warfare or about like fake news and image manipulation, um, uh, are there any examples that come to mind yourself? Like, if you thought of like, hey. Yeah, a, a bit. Um, yeah. There's this, this video about Obama. Oh yeah. Um, uh, it's lip syncing in a way, and this, this voice actor, actor actually makes him uh, a fake Obama. Yeah. And then uh, I was thinking about it this week, and then the, the focus is very much on the visual aspect of this fakeness of the video. Yeah. But then this actor is, of course, very talented, the voice actor, and he can uh, mimic the voice. But then this, 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 uh, these, these other, um, how to say, um, uh, sensibilities, so, so hearing and smelling are always outside of the discussion of, of fake and, and real, I, I, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I, I was wondering if in your project you look to, to other senses as well, because it's very much focused on, on visual, of course, but it might be the case that visual is not the main or has a different meaning in different cultures. Yeah, for sure. I think like uh, the examples we made that are quite focused on the screen still, I mean, that's yeah. kind of flat to the surface. So yeah, I mean, possibly yes. Like uh, these are these are the ones we we know and we have heard of uh, from the context. We, we know that the one you, you mentioned because yeah. it's quite an impressive one. Here? Actually, in the presentation, yeah, yeah. in an old, an other presentation, this is what you I think yeah. Yeah. referring to. Yeah, but we, we can play it, so so it's yes. maybe nice to we, to we show. We asked the audience to guess which one was the real one or or the fake one. These yeah. are their homes. The old thing. To invest in things like high tech manufacturing, clean energy and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. The results are... This is actually with his, with his own voice, huh? Yeah. So, so this is not with, uh, okay. with, with the actor, but I know the examples of the actor, and, and there is this uh, uh, also episode of Dave Lift, mm -hmm. which you might have seen last, yeah, yeah. Uh, last weekend, where, where it was shown, which is a great episode, I think also fake news. And, uh, and the development of these deep, deep, fake, deep fake videos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's definitely also um, a good, very good point about like other um, um, yeah, like, like sounds, other senses. Yeah. Um, um, especially also if you look at a, a certain countries, I think in, in, in Southern Africa, let's say in Malawi or in, in Zimbabwe, 
uh, a lot of content is still distributed through a radio. Eh? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's also something uh, to keep in mind that this is not that is not everywhere uh, visual content, um, uh, but also manipulation through like radio, um, um, uh, news, etc. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, totally. Yeah, so I would be a bit interested in what the needs and the interests are from the different cultures you're talking to, because you said like this whole debate we are having about fake news and so on is quite Eurocentric and North American based and so on. And if you think about it, it's kind of um, quite impressive that we could trust the news maybe in the end for quite a while, or we had the feeling that we could trust it, so that's also an interesting point. But then uh, when you said in Egypt nobody did trust it anyways, and there's probably a lot of other countries where it was the same. So what are the, the needs to discuss in uh, those other places that you work with? Yeah, I mean, um, maybe an example of uh, this can be the social media tax in Uganda and Tanzania. So like the government, because they don't want to spread any kind of alternative news, they just implemented a tax on social media. And it's interesting because it's technology-based, so it means Mostly WhatsApp as well, like and, and, and Facebook, right? In, uh, yeah, you have to pay certain uh, amounts of yeah, tax money for the use of social media. And uh, lately, of course, in Tanzania, there is this um, um, horrific um, uh, law which is um, 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 uh, yeah uh, against like online um, uh, perceived uh, homosexual content. Um, so there's actually this squad team that is like then looking online for like um, um, content that is deemed um, uh, homosexual, which was announced by this governor of uh, Dar es Salaam, and that was a huge like um, um, uh, yeah like attention in the media about this. Um, um, so yeah, there is um, uh, I think I think the the question of fakeness and um, uh, fake news actually much more um, how do you say. Uh, yeah, uh, tangible maybe even, and like uh, urgent in some of these contexts than here. And also these uh, spread through, let, let's say like also in, in Zimbabwe when there were the elections uh, recently, there were, were so many incidents of fake news where there were like old images being used from like South Africa, from huge publics and like also to deceive, um, um, yeah, to de deceive the public. So there is there is a lot of interest amongst the, among these researchers who uh, to look into this, I think, from from other perspectives. Yeah. 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 Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It could have been that it would have been even more different kind of perspectives, but so it's. Yeah, the, it's kind of difficult because, of course, po different political systems like understand what is fake or not in different ways, mm -hmm. and we are like, yeah. I mean, I come from Italy, come from the Netherlands, so like we have experience of these places, but we can uh, not really speak on behalf. But at the same time, in Uganda, you have these uh, great cinemas where things are done that really extend. No one cares about the, the original version, so like, that, that's very interesting to us, the, their originality, very DCT, how they play out in these different belief systems. But uh, yeah, we have to look into it uh, much more. 